All right, everyone. Good evening. Hope you all are doing well. We're going to get right into um, the service tonight. <clears throat> We've recycled and recycled and recycled all of our uh, songs, and so uh, we'll just we'll save save those for another time, maybe. And uh, hopefully we'll be back in church soon that we won't have to worry about that. But uh, in the meantime, uh, if anybody would like to record a song and send me the video, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, but I ask if you will, go ahead and take a few minutes and share the feed. Now, I think everything is working tonight. Looks like the sound is, is doing right. Uh, looks like the video is coming through okay. Um, <laughs> Brother David said, wonderful. I'm not real sure what to. Uh, but uh, take your Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Uh, I'm not going to fool with all the the uh, screen changes and all that. What you've got is what you've got. So uh, I hope that will be okay for you tonight. Uh, do remember Brother John. Uh, Smith, he is uh, still uh, here in town at the hospital. Uh, they were able to uh, uh, to do the dye test on him, take the tube out uh, of his nose uh, this this sometime today, and uh, hopefully uh, within the next day or two, maybe you'll be able to go home. And so we thank the Lord for that, and uh, I trust that you'll continue to pray for him. Also, Miss Jean, you ask the Lord just to touch there and um she's she's still trying to stay as immobile as she can and she is supposed to have let me see i believe it's the 29th is her surgery which is next thursday so remember her uh continue to pray for miss weaver's sister um others that uh <clears throat> that we've been in prayer for let's remember them and i encourage you if you will try to invite someone uh, to church Sunday. Again, we're having parking lot service on Sunday at 11. Uh, I would like to meet at some point, uh, maybe if you can come a little early, um, not only to help set up, but maybe, you know, about 15 minutes or so early to be able to discuss um, kind of the, uh, the future uh, services. If that doesn't work, then we'll just meet some other time. But um, if you can be thinking about that, maybe what might work for you. And uh, we need to uh, get a couple things squared away and settled in that. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 26. That's where we'll start tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. We'll be preaching on this thought. God, uh, I guess just God calling. I, I want to say God is calling, but uh, we'll leave it with just God calling. The Word of God says in verse 26, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things uh, which are not to bring to naught things that are. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Let's pray just for a moment. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. We ask you now that you hide us behind the cross. Lord, we pray that you might give us the words to speak to tonight. Lord, we ask you that you would help all of our folks, Lord, listening or watching. We pray that you would bless them in a mighty way. God, some are working, some may be on the way home from work, some have already worked, and they're tired and weary. We pray that you would encourage them, give them strength. Lord, we pray that you'd allow them to rest tonight. And Lord, we ask you to help those, Lord, that may be going to school. We pray the same thing for them. God, we ask you to keep them safe. Bless our folks, Lord, from this virus. I pray that you would uh, begin to work. 
Lord, we ask you, Lord, don't know how viruses work. We don't know any of those things. Lord, but we pray that you might give our nation and this world some respite from this. Lord, we pray that you might allow us, Lord, to see um, the numbers of uh, folks that have contracted the disease and uh, those that have succumbed to death because of it. We pray that those numbers would go down drastically all across this world. God, we do pray for our country. We ask you to bless our leaders. We pray for this election. God, I pray that you would uh, anoint, Lord, the president and the vice president that we have. God, we pray, Lord, if it be in your will, that you would keep them in office. God, I pray that all of the wicked ones, Lord, that may be in office today. God, I'm not necessarily asking you to do something drastic in their physical life. But, Lord, I'm asking you that you might do something in their heart. God, we pray that you change the heart and the, the views, the morals of this world. God, we ask you that you would do a work in our hearts and in our lives. God, we pray that you let Christians or Bible-believing Christians get out and vote. God, we ask you that you would, uh, Lord, show grace and mercy to our country. We love you, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 26, we see here that God has called some things. You look in verse 26, it says, For ye see your calling... How that not many wise men, not many mighty or noble are called, but it says, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. He hath chosen the weak things of the world. Verse 28, and he has chosen the base things of the world and things that are despised. And so, <clears throat> just for a moment, we're going to be dealing with those three things, really, um, in this message. Now, I want you to know that God has called all men to rest there in Matthew chapter number 11, verse 28 through 30. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And uh, it goes on, but we know today that God has called us to rest in him. In Hebrews, I believe it's Hebrews chapter number 4, he talks about a rest. And so we know that there is a call to rest. Of course, there's a call to salvation. In John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. He's told us through, Jesus Christ has told us throughout his ministry that folks must be saved. And in that, he is calling them in Paul's writing and John's writing and Peter's writing and all of these these uh, apostles or or rather let's let's use the word in all of the epistles we see that there is a call to salvation but here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 he begins to speak specifically to a couple of these groups that he has called and that's what we want to deal with tonight in um in verse number 27 he says, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, here we see this word foolish, and we'll not take the time to, to define it. Foolish is foolish. It's, it's those people or that thing that, um, uh, that really has not the learning that they need to have. Uh, children, um, even adults that are immature, they're often called foolish. And God calls the foolish. If we look back, and we can look, I believe it is, um, let me just, I don't have the reference written down for some reason. I believe it's Luke chapter number 10. That is not it. Anyway, we read about Zacchaeus. And in um, in the the gospel, God talks about this man Zacchaeus. And he gives the 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 description of Zacchaeus that he didn't use the word foolish, but he gives the history of him and says that he only lived for himself. Uh, he only uh, uh, cared about what he could accumulate, if you will. Uh, his main goal in life, as we see, one, because of his um, his position in society, his job, his career was to collect taxes, and in that, he could essentially 
uh, claim whatever amount of money that he wanted to with taxes and collect that. And so we see that he was trying uh, not only just to become wealthy, but to get ahead. And to do that, he would do anything. He was called down, though, not from a, uh, a money changer's station. He was not called out of the courthouse, but he was called out of a sycamore tree. The Bible says that he was little in stature, small in stature, and to get a glimpse of Jesus, he climbed into a sycamore tree, and it was there at the base of that sycamore tree that Jesus came to him, looked up into that tree, and said, Zacchaeus, you need to come down because I need to go to your house today. And so in in this, we see that though Zacchaeus was short in stature, I believe if we can, if we continue to read the the narrative about Zacchaeus and his story, we'll see not only that, but he fell into that uh, description of all men in Romans chapter three, verse twenty three. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, we if if you were to read after Doctor Harry Ironside, he says. Um, uh, Harry Ironside said about Zacchaeus that he was a come shorter. And truthfully, that's what we all were. We were a come shorter. No matter how we look at it, I mentioned about height and the, the lack of height in Sunday's message. There's nothing that we can do about that in our physical being. But there is something that we can do, or rather something that we can hold on to that someone else has done, that Christ has done on Calvary. When we realize that we have fallen short of the the the, the glory of God, <clears throat> then we must realize that there is nothing that we can do, but we can hold on to what he has done. <clears throat> God called foolish Jonah. You remember Jonah. He was apparently a man of God. And God called him to go to the people of Nineveh. And instead of going to those people at Nineveh, God instead, or Jonah instead, went down and down. Let's look over there. <clears throat> In the book of Jonah, we see that he continued his process. Almost preached on this a few weeks ago and decided against it. Uh, but especially when we were talking about hell, I almost used him as our text verse. But we see here. That Jonah went down to, what was it, Tarsus? <clears throat> and when he got down to Tarsus, not only did he do that, but he went, after he got onto a ship, he went down into the bottom of the ship. We see that they uh, threw him overboard. A great fish was prepared by God for him. And the great fish took him down to the depths of the sea. And so even in that, God still called foolish Jonah and told him, you need to go and preach to this people of Nineveh. It was in that belly of the whale or that great fish, if you will, that God began to deal with him. Three days and three nights, it says he was there under no doubt conviction from God. And it was there that foolish Jonah finally came to himself. Reminds me a whole lot of that prodigal son. He came to himself. The great fish spit him up on dry land. And he made a three days journey in one day and began to preach. The people of Nineveh, they were foolish as well. The people of Nineveh repented and turned to God. Now there's more to the story. He was still foolish in his thought processes, in his um, in his mentality against these sinners. But still God called foolish Jonah. Not only that, but look at our text there in verse number 27. <coughs> First Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 27. We see not only did God call the foolish, but God called the weak. It says, God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I can think back in in my own life, and I can think about the weaknesses, physical weaknesses that I have had. 
then I think about the spiritual weaknesses that I have had in my own life. But yet God has used those things in in a way that seems odd to give strength to others. We my my girls and I have been going to the gym lately and um you know if you're if you're a man you go to the gym and you want to try your best to lift as much weight in front of everybody as you can. When I first started going, I, that's what I was trying to do. But I had to come to myself. I can't lift all that weight. I might could have many, many years ago. But now I'm having to use uh, a lesser amount of weight for a lesser amount of time even than I used to be able to when I was in my teens or early 20s. But even in that weakness... Even in that weakness, God teaches me a lesson. And in our weaknesses, God, one, still calls us. But he uses that weakness to give hope to someone else that may be weaker than you. As my daughters got to the weight machines and they moved it from, let's just say, 100 pounds up to 20 pounds. Well, their question was, how can you lift that much weight? Well, in my mind, that was not near enough weight. In my mind, that was a weight that I should be ashamed of because there are other men in there that are lifting double and triple what I'm able to lift. But God still used my weakness to be able, not necessarily to impress my daughters. I don't know that I've ever impressed my daughters. But he's... he's allowed my weakness to be able to give some instruction to them, how to hold their wrists, how to uh, maneuver their their bodies, the proper form, the way to use the machines, this, that, and the other. God called the weak. I mentioned earlier that prodigal son. It was a, a young man that he was out of control. He had spent all of his inheritance. He Gave him to bad company. Remember, he wasted his substance on riotous living. He was weak. There was nothing about him that truly was um, indicative of strength in his life. Everything he did, it showed his immaturity or his weakness. But God has chosen the weak. What does he say? To confound the things which are mighty. Now, You've probably heard of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a shoe salesman. He got saved. And as he got saved, he started teaching a Sunday school class, quite possibly before there was Sunday school classes. But in that, he used this, this man that didn't amount to much. He used him to become one of the most greatest preachers and to lead many, many, many to the Lord. One of those men, as history tells us, was a man named Mel Trotter. Mel Trotter heard a man of God outside of the what was it, the Pacific Garden mission. mission. He, Mel Trotter was drunk, and he sat down on a, on a curb, from, as the story goes, or as it was told to me, sat on a curb just opposite of the Pacific Garden mission. mission. And in doing that, in his own drunken stupor, he heard the word of God preached through the open doors of the mission and gave his heart to Christ. And he too became a preacher and began to lead people to Christ. He chooses men and women and children that are weak and makes them mighty. He chooses those things that are weak, according to scripture, to confound the, the mighty. Why does God use nobodies? Well, if we were to look over in the book of Psalm, Psalms chapter number 40, I want you to look with me. He says this, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Here it is. Here's the answer to the question. Why does God choose the nobodies? Why does he choose the weak? 
Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Understand that here in this passage of Scripture, it's not that he they see what we have done, but they see what God has done in us, and they trust in the Lord. Why does God choose the nobodies? Because it's the nobodies that God can 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 tell a story with people. Oh, yeah, God will use mighty men as well. I think of Brother Bobby Brindle. Some of you may know Brother Bobby, and you pray for him. He is in dire straits right now. You ask God to, to touch that man of God. But Brother Bobby Brindle, again, as I recall the story, was a great businessman in in Dalton, Georgia, in the area that he still lives in. Great businessman in that carpet industry. And God began to call him, um, I, I don't remember if it was to be saved or called to the ministry, but either way, God began to convict him to get rid of everything. And little by little, he got rid of everything that he had. And what did he do? He began to preach the gospel. He began to tell men and women and children about a God who can take a nobody and make them somebody. But he, he can also take a somebody as far as finances and social status and break them down to nobody so that they can reach everybody. That's what God did there in Psalm 40. He took somebody that was base, someone that was nothing, someone that was weak, someone that was foolish, and he made them something in him. Which leads us to the third and final thought. God chooses or calls the base and the despised. In verse number 28, he says, he chooses the base things of the world and the things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. He calls the woman at the well. The woman at the well that was a Samaritan. She was an outcast. But yet Jesus had a need to go through Samaria. And to wait at the well for one woman to come. This woman who was in sin, this woman that had five previous husbands, this woman that after she was saved, she went back to that crowd that she was most comfortable with, the men of that city. You can read it yourself. I believe it's John chapter number eight. You can read it yourself. She left her water pot and went back and told all the men of the city. They came, heard the words of Christ and believed and went and told even more. You see, God chooses those that are at the bottom of the barrel. He chooses the base and even the despised to come to him. Why? God wants to save those that are at the bottom. God, we mentioned this Sunday, God wants to save those over on Cotton Avenue that are drunk tonight or getting drunk tonight. He wants to save those that are in a crack house somewhere here in town. That are that are that have needle tracks up their arm, or they're snorting a line of cocaine. God wants to save them. God wants to save that young boy that's sitting on the front pew of a church somewhere, or maybe holding a phone or a tablet or watching on a computer somewhere, hearing a preacher preach. God wants to save that young boy that's never done anything wrong. God wants to save all men. Christ gave this woman at the well, he gave her living water, and he quenched her spiritual thirst. Lori used to sing a song, I'd love for her to sing it again, but it's, Lord, give me a drink. Mm, mm, mm. How many times have we went to the well just to get a drink, and our, our water pot was empty, our thirst was just beyond imagination, and we went to a well in our life, and we dropped that that uh, bucket down. It was just nothing but dust and nothing but dirt. But then we go to Christ, and in Him, we find a filling of that water pot, and we can quench our thirst. That's what God wants to do 
whether you're foolish, whether you're weak, or whether you're base and despised, God calls those. He's called harlots and lepers. He's called the outcast. He's called the religious. He's called the young boy or the young girl and the old man or the old woman and everyone in between. He's called that businessman. and He's called that derelict. I'm glad to report tonight that he will call anyone to salvation. Have you ever thought that you were out of the reach of Christ? Know this. Know this. That you're not too far that God can't reach you. You're not too far that God can't hear you tonight. You you need to know this evening that God loves you. No matter if you are in one of these three or four things that I mentioned tonight. Or whether you're... Uh, you still got time. You still got three minutes. Or whether you're putting your towel and getting ready for church. Or putting that pretty dress on and you're about to walk into church. God wants to save you. You might have a songbook in your hand tonight. I'll demonstrate it. You might have, might have a songbook in your hand tonight. Here it is. Wow. <laughs> Jesus loves the little children. What about that? Didn't even have it marked. This is an old, I don't even know where I got this book. It says Gaither Music Company. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Here's a little bookmarker. I wonder what it is. I've asked Brother David to sing this song, and I don't know if he's ever practiced it or not. It's been about a year since I've asked him to do it. It may appear backwards. I'm not sure. But maybe you can read that, how you work this thing. Great is thy faithfulness. Maybe maybe you're singing great is thy faithfulness tonight. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not. Thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. You may have a songbook in your hand right now. Maybe you could sing along as I was reading those words. Maybe you grew up knowing those words, or that's a hymn that's stuck back there in your mind. I want you to know tonight that even you, if you have never been saved, God can save you and call you tonight. God calling. Maybe you need to pick it up. Maybe you need to answer. Remember the old phones that used to ring? Just such a shrill ring. Had, a, had two little bells in it. Sometimes they only had one, had a little hammer. It ring loud. Maybe God's ringing your bell tonight. And you just need to answer it. Here I am, God. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with it? Listen, I trust that you have a good rest of your evening tonight, a good week. Continue to pray for those uh, I mentioned earlier, Brother John, uh, Sister Sister Mildred is out of town. I don't know if y'all know that, but she's out of town. She should be back probably next week, and so you pray for her. And then uh, Cheryl, uh, you ask God to touch her. She's having a lot of physical problems, so you remember her. Uh, of course, uh, as we've already mentioned again, Brother John Smith, Sister uh, Jean as well. Uh, I just saw before I got on that Eddie uh, is in the hospital, uh, the emergency room, so you remember Brother Eddie. And then you ask God to touch our church. You pray for direction uh, for us to get back into church again. I do not want to rush it, but I feel like we need to uh, begin the steps of getting back into church. And so that could mean, I'll just give you some some uh, ideas that could mean that we uh, have part of the church 
during the morning service, part of the church in the after or the evening service, uh, or you know vice versa. Uh, it could mean that half of the church stays in the in the fellowship hall, the other half stays in the church. It could mean that we fit as many people in the uh, sanctuary, social distanced, and the rest, uh, regardless of that number, go to the fellowship hall. Um, I'm not real sure. There's there's some other ideas that are floating around out there. And so you pray that we do what's best for the church and um, that we do what's best for the individuals in the church. But I love you. I want you to be praying and uh, you ask God to touch us. Uh, and also there's a revival going on this week down at uh, Brother Ronnie, Water, Ronnie Waters Church uh, down in Blakely. I went on Monday night. And uh, Brother Greg Little is preaching there, and so you um, be in prayer for that revival there. They'll be going through Friday night, okay? God bless you. Until next time, folks, I hope to see you on Sunday uh, at 11 o'clock. Now, again, we need help setting up. The same folks have been doing all the heavy lifting, uh, so if you will, try to come early and give them a break, okay? I love you. God bless you, folks.